today on Ag News Daily. As far as the mineral side, we can we could recommend a lot of different things, whether it's specifically for lameness, if it's specifically for reproduction, reducing somatic cell count. Uh, we have minerals for that. We have programs for that. Every ration is different. Every situation is different. And we really try to look at the unique situation on farm. Well, welcome back to our weekly edition of the Ag News Daily Show. We're excited to give you some news headlines, some harvest updates, and of course, Delaney, we start off with weather. Of course, but I appreciate your dedication coming straight from the field here to record this week's podcast. Yeah, everybody else is getting done, and we still got quite a bit of work ahead of us. And it looks like we've got some light showers that have occurred across the nation this week, in addition to some unusually high temperatures for this time of year. However, those light showers did very little to combat the expanding drought problem. Drought continues to expand and intensify across the United States as the weekly drought monitor shows 76% of the U.S. corn production area is now in some type of drought conditions. That's up from last week's 62% and well above the 43% from last year. The soybean area in drought has expanded to 68%. That's up from 54 last week and 52% the year before. Winter wheat in drought areas is expanded also. This week's 52% went, or last week's 52% went up to 58 and above last year's 49% mark. We may see some improvements though next week following this week's rains, but that is unlikely to see much of a significant gain. Soil moisture levels are low, with 28 states measuring moisture at just the bottom 2 percentile at a depth of 16 inches. That's not only affecting our soils, it's also affecting the Mississippi River. It has now dropped to 9 feet below its low stage at the Memphis, Tennessee area, impacting river transport, especially during harvest. Mike Steenhoke from the Soy Transportation Coalition noted that for each foot of draft reduction on the river, barges carry 7,000 fewer bushels. That's about 200 tons of soybeans. In some areas, several feet of draft restrictions are being observed, leading to a reduction in tow sizes by at least 10 to 15 percent and sometimes 30 to 40 percent. Barge transportation is cost effective because it allows for loading large volumes and connecting multiple barges in tow, both which are now compromised due to those low water levels. Without much rain in sight, drought now affects 78% of the lower 48 states. Rainfall remains limited over our next week's forecast as well, but possibly a pattern change before Halloween could bring wetter conditions in a week or two to much of the country, excluding the southeast, parts of the east coast. And as we look into November's outlook... It shows an increased precipitation for the west and central parts of the United States, though it may not be enough to break drought before we get to winter. So we'll hopefully be needing, unfortunately, a lot of snow coverage this winter to help with that for next spring. Nobody likes snow. I I certainly agree. But as we look at harvest progress this week, 65% of the nation's corn crop has been harvested up from 18% the week prior. 81% of the soybean crop has been harvested up from 14% the week higher. And Tanner, we are officially done on the Groat Farms, I can say. Oh, well, lucky you. We still got a little bit ahead of us. But of course, when you involve livestock, there's always days that you don't get as much done as you want to. That's true. That's true. But speaking of livestock, this week, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, otherwise known as NCBA, released a report analyzing a nationwide tax survey of America's cattle producers. With the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act set to expire at the end of 2025, NCBA wanted to better understand how key tax provisions like the death tax relief and business deductions impact family-owned cattle operations. Stan, is that one on the radar for your family? It is, absolutely. Well, the survey showed that producers' strong support for these provisions, like the 1031 like-kind exchange, Section 179 Expensing Bonus Depreciation and Section 199A Small Business Deductions all will have an impact for producers. The survey also showed that a quarter of the respondents spend more than $10,000 a year on tax preparation, filing, and potential audits. Those expenses only add to the pressure agricultural operations remain under. We also saw NCBA President Mark Isley said that when he was starting in the ranching business, 
he saw the devastating impact that the death tax had firsthand. He also said from personal experience, the tax nearly killed his dream of ranching with his family, and I'm sure many other producers would feel the same or agree with that sentiment. That seems like a high cost of tax preparation, but I can tell you the expense coming from tax world is one that all of us try yeah. to avoid. We also saw from the NCBA that earlier this week, they shared their disappointment with the recommendations that came from the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. Those recommendations proposing to replace proteins like beef with beans, peas, and lentils. After 22 months of public discussion, the committee had a preview meeting in which the NCBA Vice President of Government Affairs, Ethan Lund, said he was disappointed by the number of chaotic new directions that were proposed at the last minute. It's good to have folks like that on the side of producers, especially if there's suggestions such as what was proposed here. The Director of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, Dr. Shailene McNeil, says these recommendations put some of the most vulnerable at risk for nutrient gaps. While beef contributes 5% of the calories in an American diet, more than 5% of the essential nutrients like potassium and phosphorus and iron, B6, nicine and protein and zinc and choline and B12, it's a healthy meat, Delaney. She notes that as a registered dietitian, she's concerned that basing guidelines on highly academic exercises and hypothetical modeling and weak science on red meat will not produce relevant or practical guidelines and will not help us achieve any healthier diets. So a lot of depth diving into this topic. The last meeting the committee had was on Tuesday, October 22nd, and they will now submit their plans to the Department of Health and Human Services in addition to the USDA. After the department receives their scientific report, it will then be posted on the dietaryguidelines.gov website. A new public comment period will be open after the committee's report is posted to collect input for the departments then to consider and develop new dietary guidelines for Americans through 2025 into 2030. So these guidelines will extend for five years, Delaney. So maybe it's an opportunity for our listeners to share their input. I know I would eat steak daily if I could. It needs to be the base of the food chart. Yeah, there's one ingredient in beef, right? And multiple in some of the alternative products that we've seen in the market. You're right. Over 400,000 households are estimated to be eligible for relief from the recent hurricane and assisting with grocery expenses from the USDA's Disaster Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program due to a recent announcement that came out. This is some new funding now geared toward grocery expenses, as they mentioned, and through this program, which the USDA makes available through states in the aftermath of disasters, people who may not be eligible for the traditional SNAP program in normal circumstances could participate in this program if they meet specific criteria, including disaster income limits and qualifying disaster-related expenses. This announcement includes the additional recent support of the announcement we talked about last week in parts of Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. They just put a D in front of SNAP. It's D-SNAP yes, D-SNAP. Now. snap That's right. Well, this week's interview, we're hearing from Zinpro, an animal nutritional company. Our team member, Michelle, connected with them at the World Dairy Expo just a few short weeks ago. So let's jump into that interview right now. We're having a conversation with our friends here at Zinpro at the World Dairy Expo. Happening is Madison, Wisconsin, and... There is a lot of producers here, a lot of fun, but first I'm here with Jeff. Tell me about some of your experiences. You're really involved in the the nutrition area. Sure. Now, I started my career as a consulting nutritionist down in Texas, New Mexico, and Kansas, and then uh, made my way to this side of the industry, and I've been with Zinpro uh, for about eight years now, and I manage the uh, dairy technical services side of our dairy business. So tell me what your role looks like with Zinpro. So uh, we provide a lot of our, number one, we provide a lot of our internal account managers with uh, technical presentations and farm visits. And, and uh, a lot of the guys that I work with have, uh, they have an elevated expertise, whether it be lameness, hoof trimming, uh, cow comfort, uh, nutrition, TMR stuff. Uh, we're here to help not only our, our external customers, but a lot of our internal account managers mostly. 
Now, when we talk about Zinfro, it, it, it's pretty big, and our listeners, they are, they're involved in agriculture in many different aspects. What is Zinpro? What do they offer to the dairy community and animal agriculture? So Zinpro is, uh, we've been in the trace mineral business now for over 50 years. We're the leaders in the trace mineral uh, segment of the industry. And, and so we have, we have uh, minerals, multiple species, but our, our main source of business is with the dairy. And uh, we differentiate ourselves through, uh, uh, with an amino acid complex mineral that it gets absorbed better and it gets utilized by the animal better to produce uh, their responses at the farm level. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges in in the dairy industry, especially their nutritional wise. There's a lot of other elements to add and especially with costs, labor, challenges. What are some of those challenges that you're helping solve for your customers? Yeah, first and foremost, we have we have minerals for all stages uh, throughout the dairy, uh, the dairy business, starting with calves, uh, colostrum, uh, higher quality colostrum for the calves. We have uh, minerals that are helping with feed efficiency, better milk production, um, immunity, somatic cell counts, uh, lameness issues, and that's really. That's really what we're trying to go for is to, to make uh, the, a, a healthier cow, so improve her well-being on that farm. And not only our products do that, but our people are knowledgeable uh, in cow comfort, lameness. Like I've already said, uh, many aspects of the dairy business we can, we can help with. When we're looking at the nutrition, there's just so many things that you can do to really continue your your dairy farm and continue to make that well-being. How do you trace it back to that nutritional program that, hey, this is why it's happening because of, let's say, lameness? You know, what? How, how are you tracing that back? You know, our goal, our goal, like I've mentioned, it, we're trying to create a, uh, through our services, on-farm services, we want to provide information to the farmer that allows that cow to be happy and produce the most milk that she can produce. Uh, along with the minerals, the minerals are helping with her being more comfortable as far as uh, re- reducing or, or boosting her immune system so she can fight off bacterial challenges or or inflammation. So our minerals have been proven to decrease infl- uh, in the inflammatory response. All of this leads to uh, a higher quality and, and more milk production better ROI for the producer. What are some of those questions you oftentimes feel when you go to the, the farm and these are some of the, the top concerns that you're continuing to hear more about? You know, we ask, we always ask, uh, what what problems can we help solve when we go to the dairy? It's not that we're going to, uh, we want to go to every dairy, throw the mineral in, and, and miraculously, uh, everything's going to be better. We we really try to understand where they are today, what problems they have, uh, who can we plug in that best is is best qualified to answer that question, and then uh, as far as the mineral side, we can we could recommend a lot of different things. Whether it's specifically for lameness, if it's specifically for reproduction, reducing somatic cell count, uh, we have minerals for that. We have programs for that. Every ration is different. Every situation is different. And we really try to look at the unique situation on farm uh, and then use a team atmosphere within Zimpro and then also work with with outside veterinarians, nutritionists. Uh, we're trying to help the producer. And if we can be part of the team that helps the producer, uh, that's what that, that's our goal. Now, there's a lot of science to it. A lot of science. What What's some of that science you really tap into as we think about Nutrition, there is a lot of complexities to it. A lot of complexities. And as far as Zimpro as a company, over 50 years, I think we're in our 53rd year now, we have over 350 peer-reviewed publications. We are highly researched. We spend a lot of time and effort on product development and our research program. Within the research papers that we have, over half of those 350 peer reviews are in the ruminant space. So we know... We know the scenarios that we need to recommend our minerals, uh, what level they need to be at, and, uh, you know, to produce 
not only milk production, but a healthier cow. And then again, I keep going back to this, but it's bottom line for the dairy producer, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be lameness uh, evaluations or, or, uh, or just getting them more milk production, um, better intakes, that kind of thing. But uh, we're, we're heavily researched, so we, we're very comfortable that if we feed or if a farm feeds Zimpro Minerals as a part of their Trace Mineral Program, then they're going to see a production response. Mm -hmm. Especially in tough economic situations like now. But one is ISO firm. Give me a, a thousand foot overview of what is that and sure. um, how it really helps. So ISO firm is a it's a it's a proprietary blend of branch chain BFAs. So these are ISO acids, and what ISO firm does is it enhances rumen fermentation to make to allow the cow to do more with what she has in her rumen now. So it makes her a better cow. Uh, she is going through a process of fermentation of, of, of forages and the TMR every day. Isoferm provides a nutrient that fuels the rumen, uh, specifically forage digesting bacteria, and it has led to increases in energy corrective milk, along with, at the same time, a decrease in dry matter intake. So we're seeing really nice feed efficiencies coming from feeding this nutrient to the rumen. So, yep, fueling the rumen first, allowing her to do more with less. Mm -hmm. Now, as we look at feed efficiency, there's a lot of ways farmers are blending those diets in to get to that, that point. What does this do that, that really makes it unique when we're talking about feeding efficiency? So the feed efficiency part, comes from uh, in in some diets there is an actual there's a lack of microbial protein making it to the small intestine there's a lack of these iso acids in the rumen uh, and so we are directly supplementing this required nutrient to forage digesting bacteria and they are we are enhancing the natural uh, rumination and digestion process that's already taken place so we're increasing uh, forage digestibilities so we're increasing energy uh, to the cow. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when that doesn't happen, when it doesn't get to that digestibility, what can be those effects on that cow? Well, what we're trying to do, so how, how Isofirm is affecting the bottom line return on investment is that we're, we're actually seeing same production or more production on, you know, the, on less feed or more production on the same feed. So that goes directly to your bottom line uh, as far as if we're improving the digestibility um, of the ration, then it, it, it absolutely translates into a more efficient cow and uh, obviously better ROI for the dairy. So how does that get mixed in and what's that process like? That gets added to a, um, to a, a premix. Um, it is a... It's a low feeding rate product, but it gets it gets uh, formulated in the ration. If there's a need for iso acids, then we understand what that need is. We recommend a certain feeding rate uh, of isoferm, and then it gets added into a a larger premix, and then into the TMR. Mm -hmm. Well, we're with our friends here at Zincro. Just just to to wrap it up here, why why should someone really look into you know, not not only you know your iso iso firm that you have, but some of this more complexity of the nutritional elements to it. Why should a, a farmer consider this as a way to expand feeding efficiency? You know, we want everyone to consider. We want everyone to know and consider Zimpro for their farm because of our uh, obviously fifty years in the industry, over fifty years in the industry, the amount of research that we have on the product. Uh, our product, our services, our people, the culture here—it's—it's—it—it—it uh, it, it, it leads to uh, production and performance for the dairy, and so we're all in this together. We want to be—we want to team team up with the dairy, partner with the nutritionist, uh, and so so they have more a uh, better well-being and health and production for the cows. Well, thanks for joining here today. How can people continue to connect with Zinpro? Yeah, if you want to learn more about Zinpro products, you can go to our website at www.zinpro.com. And there is a listing of all account managers, 
technical service people uh, that are listed on our website, and you can get a hold of us there. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jess, and uh, having us learn a lot more about feeding efficiently, and feeding efficiently, especially for cows. Thank you. Well, Michelle is just shaking and moving because I know she's at National FFA Convention this week as well. And we're going to hear a little bit more from her coming up in the show. That's That seemed like a fitting interview for today's episode, and I'm excited to see what she has for us next. We did see, though, two recent economic studies highlighted the damaging effects on trade using tariffs, especially on U.S. soybeans and corn. As the top two U.S. agricultural exported commodities, these crops together represent one-fourth of the nation's total agricultural export value. A continued tariff-based approach to trade with China places a direct target on these crops, with farmers and rural economies paying the price as a result, Delaney. The National Corn Growers Association and the American Soybean Association teamed up to put together and commission the World Agricultural Economic and Environmental Services to assess how trade war would affect soybean and corn today. I love the number of acronyms that we are (laughs) developing. That was WAIS in today's episode. The conclusion found a repeated tariff-based approach pushes the conversion of cropland in South America, which has a permanent ramification on soybean and corn exports across the world. Of course, Delaney, if China cancels its waiver and reinstates existing tariffs, U.S. soybean exports to China would fall by 14 to 16 million metric tons annually, an average decline of nearly 52% from expected baseline levels. Corn exports would drop by 2.2 million metric tons annually, an 84% decline from the baseline. While the decrease in corn exports is smaller in volume compared to the soybeans, the percentage drop is substantial given relatively lower volume of corn exports going to China. Either way, neither of those are good news. The studies confirm that Chinese tariffs on U.S. ag could have a lasting detrimental effect far beyond its temporary price decline. A separate study on the broader agricultural trade war, using different assumptions about tariff levels and market responses, suggests even more severe consequences for U.S. farmers down the road. So not a lot of great news coming out of that, but at least somebody's got their finger on the pulse. Yeah, and keeping a pulse on how trade wars affect farmers. I think it's good to have some real numbers behind those. Yeah, absolutely. Earlier this week, we saw the U.S. Supreme Court granted refiners petitions to hear a case that could determine where current and future legal challenges on small refinery exemption waivers will be argued. The Renewal Fuels Association and Growth Energy issued a joint statement saying the Fifth Circuit Court wasn't the right venue to hear these challenges on small refinery exemptions. In January of this year, the two organizations asked for a rehearing on a court decision that was made back in November of 2023 that overturned the EPA's rejection of small refinery waivers for six different oil companies. The joint statement says that the refining community's abuse of small refinery exemptions destroys demand for biofuels nationwide, which of course in turn negatively impacts farmers and biofuel producers regardless of where they operate. In addition to that, the statement also said that the economic and environmental impact of what's happening does not recognize state lines. So just a little bit of a biofuel headline for our listeners there today, Tanner. Yeah, it affects everybody across the U.S. as it doesn't apply to just one state. We've got more news for you here. There's a win for you American farmers and veterinarians. The United Nations decision to reject a proposed on-farm target reduction of antimicrobials Otherwise, the UN could have implemented a 30% global on-farm reduction in antimicrobials, as well as limits on the use of certain antibiotics in animals in agriculture, according to the National Pork Producers Council, the press release that they put out this week. The release says that this is a win for swine producers and veterinarians, since a mandated reduction of antimicrobial use would compromise what veterinarians have and the ability to provide the best possible care for pigs. So a big win 
After articles and news that didn't feel like wins for our listeners, the director of food policy for the NPPC, Dr. Ashley Johnson, says that it would have gone into effect. It would have not only been a negative impact to animal health, but also the ability to make decisions that are good for animals and the nation's food supply. If farmers wouldn't have been able to raise the animals in a safe manner, we don't know what would have happened and what the extent of those impacts would have been. But like we said, this is FFA Convention Week, National Convention. This week, more than 70,000 students and supporters flocked to Indianapolis for the 97th National FFA Convention and Expo. I've got a nephew there, and one of the Farm for Profit team members just got second place in oh. extemporaneous speaking. I love that. Can you have you? to have them on the podcast. I Can also you? did do... Yeah, yeah, I figured that was a category that you would have been yeah. in. Can you spell extemporaneous? I can. Can you? Uh-uh. Nope. <laughs> I had to look up, see what it even was. <laughs> FFA Live, Inside the Convention Reporter, and our Ag News Daily team member, Michelle, like we talked about, is there. She's having some fun and purposeful fun because it's not all play. Let's dive into that clip now. One opportunity for FFA members and supporters to connect and have fun is... The Convention Concert! I feel like it's going to be a good concert. It'll be really fun, exciting. Gosh, and we have a sign back here. <laughs> what is your sign? Guess you forgot, boy, I'm a... Iowa girl. Iowa girl. It's a play on one of Megan Maroney's songs, Georgia Girl. And some FFA concert attendees met with a special guest singer, Nate Smith. I love Nate Smith and have loved him since he started, so this is awesome. And I get to see a bunch of people who are going to be the, the future generation of, of America, and uh, it's, it's amazing to be able to, to meet all them and inspire and bring a little bit of hope and, and just some positivity out here, you know. One FFA member was asked to volunteer, which they said yes to, but it was actually to attend the meet and greet. She pulled us to the side and she was like, we actually like having participation and volunteers and FFA and it's a really great thing that y'all are trying to help out and we wanted to reward y'all for being volunteers to help out. And so we got to come down here. Smith shared with the other concert goers, it's never too late to follow your dreams. That's the inspiration FFA members walked away from the concert. That they all started from a position that we started from and that we can do something amazing like them. Agreed, it kind of showed you that Everyone kind of comes from a different background, but you can still do something no matter where you're from. Yeah, these people really made the best out of what they had and made it work. Our FFA members, they probably go to a lot of concerts, but not any concerts where the entire arena, right, is filled with their friends, people that all their age, FFA members from all over the country. Just thanks for having me. You guys are awesome. Let's party. <laughs> of FFA members came here for concerts just for them, filled with memories. From the FFA Convention and Expo, I'm Michelle Stangler. All right, that was great. Thanks again. But Delaney, we need to cap this off with markets. So what do you see happening? We certainly do. This week, weekly export numbers certainly took the cake for markets as they were buzzing after those numbers were released on Thursday. This week, we saw really large weekly export sales in corn, soy, and wheat. And the markets are starting to appear reliant and comfortable with these larger export numbers that we've been seeing over the last few weeks. Corn sales this week were reportedly up 62% from the week prior. Soybeans up 26%. And wheat cleaned up at 6% higher from the week previous. We still haven't seen that translate into price action yet after corn rebounded off of its $3.99 low last week. Soybeans also rebounding off of their $9.68 low. They've made some move to the upside here, but we have some fresh news to counteract that good export sales number we saw this week. South American weather. Over the last 24 hours, some of Argentina's key growing areas, growing corn and wheat in particular, have seen about 30 to 90 millimeters of rain, which is about one to four inches of rain, just enough to give their crop a huge bump. According to the Rosario Grain Exchange, this rain is, quote, turning the game around for corn and wheat farmers who had been facing deep losses due to the ongoing drought conditions. For corn farmers, the recent rainfall will allow farmers to resume delayed planting activity due to those severely dry conditions, 
Meanwhile, they stated that this rain had arrived at a very crucial time for the wheat crop as they are getting into their final weeks of yield development here before they start harvesting wheat next month in November. So time will see what uh, impact that has on the markets, but that's what I've got for us this week. It seems hard to believe that one to four inches of rain would have that dramatic of an impact after how dry they had been. Mm -hmm. But listeners, that's what we get to share with you this week. Remember, If you've got events that you'd like us to attend, or if you've got guests you want us to interview on the podcast, be sure to reach out. Make sure you follow us on social media and check out that YouTube channel as you can watch us report the news and share our stories with you. But Delaney, for today, should we let the listeners go? Let's let them go. 